Let's consider the struct we'll call Barry. Barry has a bushy beard. Bushy beard type likes to have an electric trimmer. So, obviously, Barry wants to have the trimmer that the bushy beard type likes. Now, what happens if Barry wants to have other types of beards too? Every C++ developer will invariably hit this error at some point. It is infuriating, it is confusing, and it uses some terminology that most developers are not actually that familiar with. And in my experience, that generally leads to developers developing the habit of sprinkle the little type name fairy dust across your code until it compiles. Voila, it compiles. What we're going to do today is actually go through what this is, why we need it, and how we can know we're going to need it before we go through the compilation process to have the compiler tell us that we needed it to begin with. Here's a definition of a Tasmanian devil. I put this together to illustrate a number of things. First off, I want to look at all the identifiers that we have throughout this snippet of code. There's a lot of them. Some of them are identifiers for types. Some of them are identifiers for template parameters. Some of them are identifiers for values. These are all identifiers though. C++ is a very expressive language. I want you to keep these in mind as we talk about some further issues because when you're coming up with names and naming things, you're creating identifiers all the time. And these are going to be used throughout your code and depending on what that identifier is can have some effects on how your code is viewed by the compiler later. So let's take a look at some of that. Now let's consider what we would need in order to create a cage for this Tasmanian devil. We're going to want to know what it's, what kind of height requirements we're going to have for the cage. And we're going to have to know something about how we're going to feed the animal in this cage. Yes, we see several errors here, but they all share a common thread. What's important to note here is that when the left side of the scope resolution operator is dependent upon a template parameter, the compiler will assume that what's on the right side of the scope resolution operator is a value. There is no keyword for value. It is the assumption of the compiler that whatever you're scoping to is going to be a value unless you say otherwise. Thus, in order to make our height type work, we need to say that it is not a value, in fact, it is a type. Voila! Our height type is now accepted by the compiler because our alias is assigning to a type, not a value. Similarly, when we are going to be using the angle brackets because we are using a template, the compiler is expecting to be getting a value and thus complains to us that our angle brackets don't make sense. In this case, because we're now in this dependent scope of the template parameter, so the compiler can't look through this template parameter, we're in this dependent scope, we're going to have to tell the compiler that this remains is in fact a template. That eliminates the issue of the template, but what we're left with after we give the parameter food t two remains is in fact a type. Notice that we're returning this from the function feed and the return of the function must in fact be a type. But again, the compiler is assuming that whatever the scope resolution uh, evaluates to is a value. So we still have to say that it's a type. And with that mouthful of a line, we now have a fully compiling snippet of code. This is the most important point to get across and to condition yourself to thinking about is that when there's values and types and templates involved, the compiler assumes that you're using values. If you are not, you have to specify otherwise. For types, you use the keyword type name and that goes at the beginning of the expression 
for templates, you have to use that paired up with the identifier that you are expecting to be the template because that is the identifier that you're going to be using your Angular brackets on. This is how the C++ grammar works. Once you get used to it, it's really not that bad. It takes a, it takes a while. I'm not going to lie. But the more you begin to look at your code in this way, the better you will understand it yourself and the less mistakes that you will make and the less you'll have to rely on the compiler to tell you what you did wrong. One of the reasons I think this rule is so hard for people to internalize is actually based on the singular exception to what we've talked about so far. And that is when we want to derive from an identifier that is based on a template parameter where the template parameter is to the left of the scope resolution operator, making this a dependent type, we actually are not allowed to say type name here. And the issue here is that in this portion of our structure, it is assumed and expected that this that all the identifiers here are going to be types. You can't derive from a value. You can't derive from a template. So everything needs to be a type. Thus, there is no reason to say type name. And it is thus forbidden. You'll find this is an error in GCC, ICC, all with slightly different takes on what the error message should be, obviously, clang, etc. So, as people try to get their head wrapped around these rules, you come across these exceptions once in a while, and maybe an old compiler allowed this or whatnot, but these exceptions do tend to make us a little paranoid over time and frustrated about the rules that we thought we knew. So keep in mind that for everything we've talked about, there is one exception to this, and that is you are not allowed to put type name in your list of base classes. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If anything was unclear or you would like to hear about another topic in the future, please let me know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to hear more.